All right. Well, thanks for having me, Jack. And it's nice to be with all of you. Um, some of this will peril will uh, if you've finished the dark green religion book, you'll see that I'm uh, drawing on it in part, but also bringing new material forward. And of course, uh, in a uh, a book, you generally I think there's only one image in the entire book. Um, and uh, I think you can get more of a visceral feel for this kind of phenomena through images and even by sounds, but we don't really have a lot of time for the sounds, soundscapes today, but I will give you a few hints where you can take some of that further. So this is a, a version of a talk I've been giving uh, recently uh, that I call Kinship Through the Senses, Arts, Sciences, and Ceremony. So for decades, I've wandered through the environmental milieu, the diverse uh, venues wherein environmentally engaged individuals and groups encounter and influence one another. I've interviewed hundreds of Greens, tracked the writers and scientists, activists and artists, and a host of others learning who and what has inspired them. I've read scores of historical and social scientific studies that address the research question that has long preoccupied my attention. What might mobilize our species to respond effectively to slow and halt the accelerating anthropogenic reduction of Earth's biocultural diversity. Now, uh, some of you are also aware that I've written quite a bit about the world's predominant religions and how, uh, to speak generally, uh, they're not mobilizing in the ways needed to address negative anthropogenic change. Um, and I've, with others, illustrated that this is due in no small measure to their religious beliefs, practices, and priorities. That's a talk for another day, and I've written widely about that with others, which you can follow up on if you're interested. So today I'm gonna to focus on those who have deep feelings of kinship with species other than our own, and how such feelings often animate pro-environmental behaviors. These feelings are integrated into an overall worldview or cosmovision, that includes a, cosmology, a cosmogony, an understanding of how the world came to be, perceptions of belonging to nature, humility about the human place in the world, convictions that all living things have intrinsic value, as well as love and loyalty to Earth and its living systems. This approach also underlay my effort in Dark Green Religion, in which I examined diverse uh, spiritualities that have traits and characteristics that in many ways resemble contemporary paganism, including those forms of it that consider the gods natural symbols rather than spiritual entities of some sort. The characteristics of dark green religion are overviewed in the following slides, which may be familiar to you. Notions that nature itself is sacred, not uh, its value is not only indirect by virtue of having been divinely created. All living things have intrinsic value and deserve respect and reverence. Uh, all form, life forms share a common ancestor and thus are quite literally kin with corresponding moral responsibilities. Also typical is an ecology-based understanding that all life is interconnected and mutually dependent. And these beliefs are woven in with deep feelings of belonging and connection to nature and a corresponding humility about the human place in the world. Dark green religion also shares certain epistemological premises. In other words, they share the view that there's a variety of ways one can arrive at proper spiritual perception, including about the kinship of all life. These ways include direct visceral sensory experience in nature, science, which displaces human beings from the center of the universe and challenges the notion that the world was made just for humans, and the arts, which can evoke similar perceptions and also, as I will argue, ceremonies. Now, E.O. Wilson's and Stephen Kellert's biophilia hypothesis lends credence to the idea that it's possible in these ways to nurture and evoke our innate affective connections to nature. Mm. And such spiritualities typically also involve perceptions that death is not to be feared, but accepted as the necessary wellspring of all life, as well as uh, experiences of awe, wonder, and a love of nature. All these experiences are common pathways to dark green spirituality. This chart, you may recall, emphasizes that such spiritualities typically have animistic dimensions and holistic Gaian metaphysics, some forms of which are entirely naturalistic. 
With the rest of my time, I will provide some examples of what I see as the four main pathways to dark green nature-rooted spiritualities, namely pathways to the senses, the arts, the sciences, and through ceremony. And each of these resonate deeply with contemporary paganism and are worth considering as little recognized expressions of such spirituality, especially of its naturalistic forms. Specifically at the center of such spiritualities are feelings of belonging to nature and kinship with all living beings. Perhaps direct visceral sensory experiences in nature, including experiences of awe and wonder at the beauties, mysteries, and sometimes terror of nature are the most common pathways. This often takes place through personal encounters with non-human organisms. Such spirituality is exemplified by John Muir, the Scottish American naturalist, who was enraptured by beauty, by the beauty and power of nature and wrote that through such experiences, we, are so, we see ourselves part of wild nature, kin to everything. Another experience that often leads to kinship sentiments transpires when someone looks into the eyes of a non-human animal. The primatologist Jane Goodall, for example, felt a deep sense of connection looking into the eyes of a male chimpanzee whom she named J David Greybeard. Many ethologists, including Mark Beckhoff, Carl Safina, and Jeff Mason, blend personal experiences when they express and promote kinship feelings. Scores of artists seek to evoke or reinforce kinship with non-human organisms and environmental systems, not uncommonly by expressing kinship feelings first experienced through sensory encounters with other species. Here are a few tantalizing examples from ancient cave art, paintings by the Hudson School painters in the US, as for example, these paintings by Edward Hicks. Another artistic example is Franz Lanting's Eye to Eye, Intimate Encounters with the Animal World, a large book replete with stunning photographs of animal eyes, which he produced to help people, quote, see the world through other eyes and to celebrate the kinship of all life. What I have called eye-to-eye -eye epiphanies often lead to kinship sentiments, and they're also often reflected in performances and here in posters from ornithological conferences. In 2021, the Center for Humans and Nature published a five-volume series of prose and poetry titled Kinship, Belonging in a World of Relations. The series included essays by Richard Powers, who won the Pulitzer Prize for Literature for his kinship-promoting novel, The Overstory, and Robin Kimmerer, a botanist and indigenous scholar from North America who blends science and animistic kinship ethics. Just a couple of weeks ago, Robin Kimmerer was awarded uh, a MacArthur Fellowship, which is popularly, popularly known as the Genius Prize, which shows another example of the cultural traction these kinds of kinship spiritualities have. The internationally distributed radio program and pod podcast, to the best of our knowledge, also featured the Kinship series, further promoting paganism resembling nature spiritualities. You can Google that and, uh, and listen to that really evocative podcast series. Its episodes included Jane Goodall's eye-to-eye -eye experience with her favorite chimpanzee that changed the way she thought about their consciousness, agency, and value. The sciences especially astronomy and cosmology, ecology and botany, and evolution and ethology, as well as Gaia theory, all provide powerful testimony to the kinship of all life. Charles Darwin presaged scientific kinship in understandings when he expressed empathy for all organisms with whom we share a common ancestor and a struggle for existence. In the 1940s, the American uh, ecologist Aldo Leopold drew on this uh, understanding to argue this new knowledge from Darwin should have given us a sense of kinship with fellow creatures, a wish to live and let live, a sense of wonder over the biotic enterprise. Scores of scientists have also explicitly stressed the biological kinship between our own and all other species. The Hall of Human Origins at New York City's American Museum of Natural History exemplifies how the science curators use diverse sculptures, images, and interpretive panels to teach biological kinship. 
This display shows that given their evolutionary proximity, 98.8% of human DNA is the same as chimpanzees. Indeed, a host of organisms share family resemblances, for example, by showing the similarity between their appendages. The ancient, the adjacent text stated, all living things from people to butterflies to mushrooms are related to one another. Both humans and birds have eyes, for example. This is a homology, a feature that two different living beings inherit from a common ancestor. The nearby Hall of Biodiversity has many aesthetically pleasing displays of Earth's diverse organisms. This venue includes evocative nature reverencing aphorisms penned by famous artists, scientists, and activists, all expressing kinship and promoting conservation. Near Johannesburg, South Africa, several scientific sites, including Sturkfontein, also known as the cradle of humanity, trace the evolutionary story from its beginning to the emergence of Homo sapiens in Africa to the present day. At Cirque Fontaine, visitors are urged to discover their true selves, which means their animal selves and their kinship with all other human beings, while emphasizing that evolution teaches that we are one species, no doubt in part to help overcome the country's racism fraught history. These, image, these venues also made clear that humans are biologically related to all other living things. The two oceans aquarium in Cape Town, South Africa presents similar messages. It does so, however, in an overtly spiritual way and thus an unusual way. It's credo that the ocean is sacred greets visitors immediately upon entry while adjacent banners declare that whales are central to the reawakening of our spiritually connected place within the living universe. Here, kinship is not only whales, with whales, but with the entire living universe. And as with many museums around the world, scientific understandings were mixed with calls for conservation and evocative words stressing that we all belong to nature. Here, the late Nobel Prize winner and anti-apartheid activist Archbishop Desmond Tutu asserted that the African principle of Umbutu enjoins kinship among all beings. Astute observers there would also recognize that the curators designed the displays to evoke awe, wonder, and even love for marine life and the biosphere as a whole. Indeed, curators around the world, as shown in this further example from the Monterey Bay Aquarium in California, often seek to arouse feelings of belonging to nature and kinship with all life. Its entrance exhorts visitors to connect to the animals, plants, and habitats of the bay, and again, through aphorisms from writers and scientists, such as Thoreau's statement about wildness preserving the world, and Terry Tempest Williams' reminder that we are connected, what we are connected to rather than what we are separate from, the aquarium promotes a spirituality of belonging and connection to nature. With the right lenses, we can see paganism resembling nature spirituality in moving pictures, theme parks, festivals, parades, and many theatrical performances. Many documentaries and theatrical films exemplify how the arts blend kinship feelings with science and conservation. Walt Disney's True Life Adventure series, which began in 1948, blended science with anthropomorphic storytelling, and many of its animated films blur the line between humans and other species and thus promotes interspecies kinship. And Disney Nature, a new documentary division that was created in 2008 to foster, as Disney's then CEO put it at the time, greater understanding and appreciation of the beauty and fragility of our natural world. In part, the strategy was by tugging at human heartstrings to reveal bonds between humans and other species in ways that will capture your heart. Asking viewers to contemplate, what would life be without them? One Disney nature executive even claimed that their objective is to teach the intrinsic value of nature. A year after Disney nature was established, James Cameron released Avatar, which metaphorically contended that indigenous peoples have intimate relationships and ethical responsibility toward all forms of life. Since 2007, the film's uh, themes are expressed at Pandora, the world of Avatar, a domain within Disney's Animal Kingdom theme park. There and throughout the Animal Kingdom, in a variety of artistic ways, kinship and conservation take center stage. 
I should also add uh, while we're before we leave the uh, the section here on on Avatar and Pandora is that uh, this December in just a couple months there's the uh, the first of four more Avatar uh, films are, will be released. Indeed, rising to a height of 44 meters at the very center of the animal kingdom is a sculpture model after the African baobab tree, which is often referred to as the African tree of life. The tree's creator entangled the limbs, wings, and other body parts in a way that suggests interconnection and kinship. Two final examples demonstrate how sometimes kinship ceremonies reach global audiences. One of the most remarkable of these occurred during the welcome ceremony to the United Nations World Summit on Sustainable Development in Johannesburg, South Africa in 2002. It featured a mythic story of the evolution and flourishing of life on earth, depicting a time when people lived in a kind of Edenic harmony, which was followed by a time of greed, degradation, and peril. But in this pageant, the story ended happily as humans came to recognize their kinship with all life and re-establish harmony with nature. The ceremony concluded with Earth's children marching in under an iconic and sacred Earth as the General Secretary called on the assembly to act in concert to protect Gaia. At this event, similar themes were even promoted by Sanyo and other corporations. The same year, the opening ceremony of the World, the Winter Olympics in Salt Lake City, Utah, celebrated Native American reverence for Mother Earth before a global television audience estimated at 3 billion souls. Today, I'm seeking to highlight the ways the senses, art, sciences, and ceremonies are used to express and promote perceptions of kinship between our own and other species. I've suggested that such phenomena exemplify what I've called dark green religion. I've argued, moreover, that since Darwin published On the Origin of Species a little more than 160 years ago, dark green spiritualities have been spreading rapidly around the world. They might even contribute, eventually, to humankind learning its planetary manners. <laughs>